good, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. As we start to wind down the panel sessions here, we bring, we bring you uh, uh, an exciting discussion on uh, the closing finish line and getting a deal done and what the strategies are to ensure a smooth transaction. Uh, similar to the last panel, uh, we got a compact uh, time here. We got 30 minutes, so we're gonna try to keep it compact and tight. Uh, but we do encourage questions along the way. So feel free to raise your hand, ask questions, but we will also reserve five minutes at the end for, for questions from the field. So uh, we'll do some quick intros and then just get into it. Uh, and I'll start with myself. I'm, I'm probably the least interesting guy here. Uh, I'm an attorney, so not a, not a sponsor or capital provider, but uh, I'm a partner at a law firm in Boston, Burns and Levinson. We do a lot of middle market M&A on the buy and sell side. That includes working with sponsors, independent capital providers, that kind of stuff. So I um, want to turn it over to our panelists um, and then we'll get going from there. So we'll start with Robbie. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, it's good to see a lot of familiar faces here after so long. So um, I'm happy that we're back from the pandemic. Um, but like Brian said, my name is Robbie Marcos. I'm a founder and managing partner of Samson Capital Group. We're a uh, committed private equity fund that's dedicated to independent sponsors. So all of our deals go through independent sponsors. We write five to $10 million equity checks into our deals. We don't do any debt. Um, we're, we look for cash flow um, opportunities. So anywhere between three to $15 million of EBITDA, happy to be majority or minority investors. In fact, we welcome co-investors in our opportunities. Um, industry agnostic, uh, we only avoid things that have binary-like returns, so no biotech, no pharma, no venture, no real estate. We do, um, uh, and then we avoid anything with like commodity, like high commodity-like risk, so no oil and gas. Um, besides that, we're happy to be majority again or minority investors in our deal, and um, you know, happy to be here. So thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Sheeran. I am with Longhouse Partners. We are a Detroit-based independent sponsor. Uh, my partner and I both uh, spend uh, a long time at Huron Capital in Detroit before breaking away about uh, four years ago, uh, hanging our own shingle and, uh, and happy to be on, on this side of the fence. Uh, we've made three investments thus far under the Longhouse banner. Uh, generally speaking, we look at things two to 10, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, of EBITDA across uh, business services, consumer and niche manufacturing. And I'd like to thank the iGlobal folks for using my high school graduation photo um, here, no, I, I, uh, that, 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 that picture was taken before I became an independent sponsor and got all the gray hair, so. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rob Bauer. I'm a Minnesota-based independent sponsor. Uh, started Bassett Creek Capital in 2016. Uh, we've done seven acquisitions um, since our founding, and three months ago, we had our first exit. Uh, Focus on companies doing two to 10 million of EBITDA, uh, primarily in four industry verticals, uh, industrials, business services, distribution, and tech-enabled services. Happy to be here. All right. Hi, Evan Gallinson, Merit Capital, uh, Chicago-based fund. We're not quite where Robbie is at 100% of our deals with independent sponsors, but over the last five years, it's, it's, uh, it's been 75%. And uh, we've been doing this for about 30 years. So we we didn't necessarily call them independent sponsors 30 years ago. They're just crazy people who didn't have money and had good deals that, that, that we like to support. Um, but obviously this has developed a lot over the last 30 years and you know, excited to be here and forward to kicking this panel off. Thanks guys. So as you can hear, we've got a good balance of independent sponsors and capital providers here. So we hope to bring you sort of perspectives from both sides uh, and what it takes to, to close a deal and, and frankly also what what may happen or how we sort of work around if things do go a little bit sideways. Uh, but kicking off on the smooth side of things um, and, and just sort of as a, a caveat, I don't have any directed questions for you folks. So feel free to jump in and answer as, as they come along. Um, want to talk about sort of ensuring a smooth partnership between the sponsor um, and the capital provider at the outset and whether that's at the LOI stage or, or later on uh, while you're in definitives. Um, one of the folks here talk about what are some of the things that can ensure a smooth relationship and sort of pave the path towards a smooth closing. I, I can start if you guys want. Um, so I would say, you know, I'd probably repeat something that some of you guys probably heard yesterday. Um, Grant Corman had mentioned, you know, make sure you know your partner, right? Uh, reference check your partner or your potential partner. And I, it's interesting because I think it's the, you know, that's like the ind industry norm for the institutional capital provider who's providing the equity or the debt 
to reference check the independent sponsor, right? And and the sponsor may give you know their own names, but what I found obviously to be the most helpful is talking to my counterparts, right? The other capital providers who've been providing that equity check or that debt check to that sponsor. That's when I get the most honest opinion about what the partnership might look like pre, during, and even post. And so um, I find it I find it interesting that. Um, in a lot of cases, my colleague and I have to promote the idea of reference checking your capital provider. It happens all the time. It's kind of one of the missing things or the missing product line that um, or channel that the sponsor is not thinking about. I think they think about the relationship, of course, but not not really referencing your capital provider. So I would, you know, one of the things to make sure it's a smooth relationship and you guys are fully aligned, just early on, just do a reference check on your capital providers and, and do it with each other. That's the most important thing. I can give you a couple of names, but find out other independent sponsors who that capital provider um, interacted with or invested with. So I think you'll get the, the best sense of alignment and the idea of partnership or whether they're good partners or not through that. So I'm just reiterating something that came out yesterday, but I, it happens a lot with us and I think it's important. Uh, I think we did this last last time too, but just by show of, of hands, I'm curious about the mix of, of independent sponsors versus capital providers. So how many people are independent sponsors in the room here? And then how many capital providers? So looks like maybe a majority are capital providers for whatever it's worth. So um, no, uh, you capital providers that, that we independent sponsors talk and, and talk about you. Um, and, and I, that's a good thing. And, and for the independent sponsors, it's, you know, we, I certainly, especially if you're, if you're newer, um, you know, make friends with some independent sponsors here today and at other events like these, because it's, you know, we're a great resource for each other, uh, because we do talk and we do compare notes. Um, we've been we're really fortunate that three deals we've done, I was just thinking about it. Um, we know two of the deals I I've known one of the principals for since the nineties. Um, and, and the third deal I'd, I'd known the guys for about probably 12 or 15 years. So. Um, it just says, A, I'm old, but, uh, but B, if you can, uh, you know, have those pre-existing relationships or, or, or work on those relationships and have conversations with people over time and get to know them. Um, and then, uh, again, independent sponsors, you know, ask other independent sponsors, um, you know, who, who are good folks to work with. Uh, if there's a group you're looking at, you know, what do you know about these folks? But, but absolutely uh, do your diligence on, on who you're partnering with because, uh, you know, not every deal is going to go perfectly swimmingly and you want to know how people are going to, what kind of partners are going to be. Chris is absolutely right. Independent sponsors do share notes and uh, it's brutally honest, um, you know, uh, what's good about the capital provider, what's bad about the capital provider. Uh, one thing I always look for when I'm looking at a deal with a potential partner is I just really want to get along with them. Like I want to enjoy spending time with them. I don't want it to feel like a boss employee relationship. Uh, the way I look at it is that it's a three to five year marriage. And one thing I've done the last couple of years is I will fly out to them and have a dinner with them once I've discussed a deal. Um, we're not really talking about the deal points, but if, if I'm spending an hour, two hours breaking bread with a capital provider, I'm going to get a feel if it's a good you know, cultural fit. Uh, because you know, we put together a lot of you know, strategic plans, um, a lot of just a lot of PowerPoint decks, but things don't go perfectly. And if I get along with the capital provider and if, 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 there's, if, if, if there's a good cultural fit, then I have the confidence we can get through pretty much anything. Uh, one thing that I've also done is on an Excel spreadsheet, I lay out what the responsibilities and what the objectives are for both the capital provider, me as the independent sponsor and the management team, just so we are on the same page. And it's a non-binding document, but I make everybody sign the document just because it that makes it more real. That's, can you send that around to all of us? Because I think we need to do that with some of our independent sponsors. I mean, we, we, we love the community, um, you know, but let's, let's get down to it. When we're looking at a deal, we are looking at the company and we're saying, are we buying this company at the right price? To Rod's point, we don't want to get partnered up with an independent sponsor that we're not going to work well with. And, and that's, that's obviously very important because you don't want a dynamic. And we can share some more stories here about when we made that mistake. But ultimately, it's the independent sponsor, I think, being more honest with what role they want to take. Because 
we're not going to not do a deal based on maybe an independent sponsor wants to be more board level, doesn't want to be involved as much, really wants to you know, partner up with us and, and do, we each do half the work. It's what, because ultimately we're going to decide that we like this company, do we like this management team. Once again, independent sponsor being honest and being a good partner with us is, is, is important, but it's, it's really writing down those roles and responsibilities. I think that's a good idea to actually put it on paper because we've, we've been disappointed more times than not where the independent sponsor said, hey, we're going to do all these things. You know, three months into the deal, six months into the deal, you know, something comes up and it's like, where are they? And it's, uh, that's, you know, that's, that's the part where we get very, you know, obviously very frustrated with where they've, they've kind of overpromised at the front. So I think, you know, Rob, Rob may have a good solution of, hey, let's, let's just go back to that document and say, hey, these are things we're going to do. Just to, uh, to reinforce the importance of a smooth partnership at the outset, can you guys maybe give some examples of things that, um, you know, do go wrong when, when you're not sort of setting that relationship out at the outset and um, some of the pitfalls that can happen sort of during that transaction. If, you know, say, for example, it's a new you know, relationship with the, with the independent sponsor and the capital provider, and you haven't sort of spent that time breaking the bread, uh, what are some of the pitfalls that can arise during the deal process? I'll go ahead. So, you know, er earlier in my career, this is one of these lessons learned deals. Uh, you know, I got introduced through, uh, through an investment banker who, who was a friend of mine, but he didn't necessarily really know the independent sponsor. So I had no interaction with the independent sponsor except a quick email intro. Hey, they've got a deal under, under letter. Uh, you know, here's a one-page teaser. I basically started, it was, it was a very attractive looking deal. I mean, it was everything you wanted. It wasn't customer concentration. They're paying a good price. It was good margins. Everything lined up, you know, exactly how we wanted. So, you know, frankly, as a younger person eager to get a deal done, I was, I was excited. So, get, you know, get on the phone with the uh, independent sponsor and they're like, hey, this deal's closing in 45 days. I need your best terms. I need it tomorrow. I'm like, okay, you know, what, what other information you have? They're like, well, let me, let me uh, you know, I'm, I'm teaming up with the CEO on the outside. He knows the company. Uh, the, the current CEO and owner is going to retire. You know, we're, we're, we partnered up. We've, we, we've, we're putting this deal together. So basically he said, but before I give, you know, our conversation and then I want your best and final terms. Closing in 45 days. Well, do that. He negotiates, you know, very good economics for himself. Um, and what happens once he, he says, hey, okay, we'll accept their economics. We're working on the deal. And I was like, all right, now download me all the information. Well, there wasn't that much information available. We were not 45 days from close. You know, this deal, we ended up doing it. We had to close five months later. What we were told in the one-page teaser and the one-hour phone call before we agreed to economics and structure, you know, turned out to be a lot different when we got you know, close to close, um, you know, got to the point where, once again, didn't know the independent sponsor very well, you know, probably should have taken more time, done some, and then now this was the independent sponsor's first deal. So there wasn't a lot of background history, talked to other capital partners, a little tricky. Once again, really liked the deal. So was over eager to move forward, had thought that he was really close with the CEO was going to take over. So thought that they were kind of, you know, you know, working together. Well, as we got closer to closing, you know, I, I start getting calls from the CEO, like, Hey, do I have to work with this guy? I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm like, uh, well, yeah, I thought you guys put this whole thing together. He's like, yeah. We, he's like, well, I sourced the deal. I'm like, oh, I thought the independent, I, I didn't know. Like, he's, like, he's like, and the economics that he's offered me, because I offered them a package economics, and I guess I, I really gave it to the independent sponsor, who then basically offered the CEO a very, very little piece of that. And he wasn't very, you know, he wasn't necessarily very happy with what his offer was. And I was basically locked in and we we're, you know, we wanted to get the deal done. So we, we ended up closing the deal, knowing that we're going in with the, our independent sponsor, our CEO, not that happy. And, you know, right out of the gates, I mean, the board meetings were contentious. Those two guys didn't like each other. Um, the fact that the company didn't do well out of the gates, not the independent sponsor's fault. And, you know, certainly our fault, we, we agreed to, we weren't doing the deal based on what the independent sponsor, we did our own research, so we can't blame anyone, but we went into a deal and it just, for two years, I mean, talk about not wanting to be around people. It was just a miserable experience being in the board meetings together because you had two people who didn't want to talk to each other. Eventually, we, uh, the independent sponsor agreed to, to step off. I mean, by this point, there's really no value to the company and there never ended up being any value. So the independent sponsor didn't really walk away from anything, but did walk away from the deal and, and uh, you know, made the board meetings at least more pleasant besides the fact the company wasn't doing well. But bottom line is, it, it is some of that, you know, that that's the mistake up front is not is, is trying to be too aggressive. You guys sometimes ask once again for economics and packages when we don't have the full information. And then when we got close, we probably should have 
renegotiated something, probably you know, made the economics more, more fair for the CEO because he was very involved in sourcing and had that hard conversation, but was just too eager to get a deal done. And, and that was a, a mistake that was made. I'd probably follow up on that. And I, this ties into what Rob was saying and Evans um, just said, but um, I would proudly admit we haven't had a sour relationship yet. So that's a positive, but you know, could we have avoided some major brain damage up front? Absolutely. That's happened a couple of times, which we've learned from. And, and a lot of that is, again, kind of going back to the first topic was around alignment and, and understanding who your partner is and understanding what the independent sponsor you know, is, expects, right? And, and around the roles and responsibilities. But I've, I've found kind of the trend, at least, you know, we've been doing it for about eight to 10 years. And um, the issue usually happens with kind of new entrants, both not just independent sponsors, but both sides, capital providers. You know, I, I think of the independent sponsor space as an asset class today. It's, there's a market. It's, you know, there's terms that people have agreed to on hundreds of deals now. And, um, but when you're a new entrant with, with not the right mind frame or not enough experience as an independent sponsor or understanding of the asset class, you come in with a, a, a very off uh, kind of idea of the terms. And so I think, you know, trying to understand, you know, what's, what is market, what's, what's appropriate, um, will save both sides a lot of time and what's the responsibilities. And, and again, like sometimes we might see a new entrant treat a capital provider as just a check and completely passive. That's not the independent sponsor world asset class. It's, it's all about a partnership. Um, if we wanted to be a passive LP, we would just invest in traditional private equity funds. And so um, this is all about the partnership, capitalize the P, there's equity rights, there's consent rights, there's governance rights, it's a partnership. We're, we're trying to get into this deal together for the next three, five, seven, maybe 10 years. Um, and then it's not just the independent sponsors are playing. The new, there's a lot of new capital providers who come into the um, at, you know the independent sponsor asset class and want to treat the independent sponsor like a broker. And, and that's not what the independent sponsor space is about. So you kind of have to know who you're dealing with. So do that up front. Otherwise, you're going to waste a lot of time like we did early on. Given the uh, time constraints, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but maybe it's good to get an independent sponsor perspective on this. So maybe Chris or, or Rob, real quick. Well, there, there certainly are potential circumstances where uh, the independent sponsor and the, and the uh, capital provider may start to look at the world in divergent ways. I mean, there's, there's any sort of, and I'm talking post, uh, post LOI, there's any sort of, you know, diligent hiccups that can happen, whether it's a bad QOB um, or, you know, something else that you, you uncover in diligence that, that may, uh, may be kind of spooky. Uh, and, and it, it could be a, a, an independent sponsor trying to get their first deal done, or, or maybe they're just in love with the deal. Um, they may be a little bit more uh, willing to look past uh, some of these warts or some of these hiccups than than you know, maybe they're you know they're, they're good. We, we might do one deal a year. Um, you know the capital provider might do you know five or you know if they're more mes oriented they might do ten deals a year, um, and, and they can frankly be afford to be a little bit more selective perhaps. So you have potential a potential tension there where the independent sponsor might say yeah that's okay and then and the capital provider said mm, it's not for us. Um, we, we haven't had that situation. We actually had a situation earlier this year, uh, a company that had a, a small division that, that did some electrical contracting, some union work. And so they participated in some multi-employer pension plans. And we asked very specifically about it pre, pre LOI, um, and, and actually went into the LOI, uh, with our capital provider, uh, capital provider together. We kind of issued the LOI jointly, but we had asked very spe specifically about this just issue. And then fast forward two months, we, Q of E was done. Uh, investment banker kind of sheepishly comes back and says, "Oh, by the way, here's a you know here's the updated uh, you know assessment of the of the liability." Which, you know, we looked at the date. It was it was before we had signed our LOI, so they were sitting on this this liability, which was you know three times what uh, what they had told us it was. And uh, so we you know, we talk about can we can we carve out this division? Uh, you know, then this deal gets too small, and 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 we were we were absolutely on the same page with our capital provider in that case, but. Um, you know, if, if we were maybe somebody different or, uh, or if it was, you know, our first deal, and we were desperate to get it done, we probably would have had a, you know, we probably would have either had, had a fight with our, uh, with our capital provider or, or may have, may have parted ways. Um, so there are, there are circumstances where, where the incentives can be uh, a little bit misaligned. We haven't, unfortunately, haven't had any major issues with that ourselves, but. Yeah, the, the, the quick war story I have where things have gone south early on is uh, three months after closing, um, 
a, a legal HR issue came up at one of at, at the company, and the capital provider and I were aligned on how to address the issue. Um, you know, we had our lawyers getting involved, um, and we had a great plan. The problem was we assumed that the CEO of the business didn't want to handle it. He actually liked handling legal HR issues. And so um, he, he, we were doing double work. Um, and so you know, we had a conversation and that's actually when I came up with the, hey, the roles and responsibilities. So um, capital partner, independent sponsor relationships are important, but also make sure you communicate to the management team um, you know, what your roles are as well. So it's a good segue. So let's, let's turn more to the deal side where, you know, you assume there is a good relationship and partnership between the sponsors and the cal providers. What are, and, and you guys have touched upon a little bit about it, Chris and Rob, but what are the, some, some of the things that can come up in a deal with the target, you know, where there's a pot potential retrade, the economics change, and could lead to a situation where the cal provider, frankly, wants to walk away and then you kind of deal with the conflict of interest where, you know, the sponsor wants to close the deal. They put all this time and effort into it. Uh, and, but frankly, the economics don't make a whole lot of sense for the uh, capital provider. So maybe we can go down the line or, or talk about situations, how you deal with that and uh, try to get a deal done, even though it might not make sense anymore. Um, I, you know, Rob and um, Chris touched on it already, but as an independent sponsor, I will, I will admit your job is harder than the capital providers. And so, and you gotta, you gotta respect that and you gotta appreciate that because you're spending a lot more, we may see the deal right at LOI or right before it, but you probably worked six months to a year before you even got it to that, to that stage. That was time, money spent. So the reality of the situation is your job's harder and it takes a lot, a lot longer for you to, there's a lot more investment in that opportunity than, than the capital provider by the time they see it. So. I think you got to just be honest with yourself. Again, somebody said it yesterday, it's burn the boats behind you. If you're going to be an independent sponsor, you better be you have enough liquidity behind you to support yourself for one or two years to find that first deal if you're new. Um, make sure you're you know, having those good conversations early with potential capital providers, both debt, equity. But it's a, it's a, there's true conflict of interest. There, there can be a point in time where their you know, interests diverge. And it's easier for us to walk away from a deal than it is for you. So now you also have to be honest, the capital providers have to be honest with themselves too, right? Things are not right down the middle once you go through your true diligence. So there's usually parameters or ranges that everybody should be comfortable with, um, you, you know, in, in terms of divergence from, a, from the economics, but of the company itself. But, you know, things trend more than a couple of standard deviations away from what everybody's underwriting. I think it's in, in the capital providers, you know, right to walk away. And honestly, if you're a good independent sponsor, you're walking away hand in hand with the, with the capital provider. So there just has to be discipline, but you know, there's a lot behind it. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll just tell a story. So there's, there's four independent sponsors that I've done a deal with and actually three of the four I've done multiple deals with. And it's just, there's, I mean, we've been talking about it all along. It's that trust factor. It's that, Hey, we're willing to walk away. I mean, I was actually, we're, we got a deal in LOI, one of them right now. And then earlier this morning, we're on a call and, and we get off the call and, and the independent sponsor is more fired up than I am. Like, this is BS. Like, we got to lower the price. We got to do something different, which is, you know, exactly what I was thinking, but not often what you hear from independent sponsor because the, the incentives are, are, are different. But this is why I work with, once again, these four groups in particular, because they're, they, they know there's another deal down the line. Now, maybe it's more difficult, as Chris said, when it's your first deal and this isn't their, any of their first deals. Um, but it's, it's, it's that... Hey, think exactly like a capital provider. Like you're re you're representing the the check, and I, I think a lot of most independent sponsors do, or a lot a lot do, but not all of them. And uh, be willing to say, hey, let's walk away from this one, or let's you know risk this deal going away, so we can focus on the next one. And uh, you know, I so earlier this year a, a deal came to us that I, that was it was a shop deal by investment banker. It was an industry we liked. The deal didn't get the deal didn't get done. We 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 barely were involved with the earlier process, but an independent sponsor ended up getting under letter. And uh, we went out and, you know, I, I got in introduced to them. They didn't have any specific industry reason. They, they really didn't bring any value to, to the deal specifically, but they had the deal. And, you know, there was, it was maybe, at, you know, it was at a relatively reasonable price. And 
I was kind of surprised by it, but they said, hey, come visit the company. You know, we're, we're inviting a couple of people to go visit the company. Since we knew the industry, we took the trip. We got out there and sat in the meeting and the owner, quirky guy, independent sponsor, quirky guy. It was just a weird, the weirdest, I, the meeting was, was basically, we had to take over the meeting, which is strange because we weren't even chosen as the capital provider at that point in time. So we were really just leading the meeting. They had some very strange conversations and comments. And, and basically we walked out of the meeting and said to them, Hey guys, you, you've been, you've had this deal under LOI for a couple months now. And I, I, I kind of see why you don't have a capital provider because this dynamic in this room, I was, so I was dead honest with them, maybe, maybe too honest with them, but I was just like, this, this isn't going to happen for us. We, can, we love the deal and we're willing to do something here, but we can't have you part of it. No independent sponsor wants to hear that. Right. Obviously we said, Hey, we'll work out some economics for you, but this isn't, this isn't going to happen. And they said, of, of course, not surprisingly, they said, Hey, let us think about it. Three months go by. They don't find another capital provider. They call us back again and they say, okay, we're willing to do that deal. Okay. By the time I get reintroduced to the, ma the management team is done. They, they, you know, this independent sponsor was, you know, had dragged them on for nine months under a letter, but we, we, you know, we, we were, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater. We had no, no chance of getting back and we tried to, to revive it. They ended up, you know, going with another group deal. Ha deal hasn't closed yet. So who knows, but it was one of those where the independent sponsor, it, we, they, they would have had, like I said, it wasn't the best economics, wasn't everything they dreamed up, but they were going to get something. And, uh, you know, just try to be honest about how the, it, it wasn't going to be a good dynamic. We got the deal done together. So good, good lead into my next question. This is for the, the sponsors here. Um, if a capital provider does walk away, what can an independent sponsor do and what strategies can they take to ensure that a deal gets done? If in fact, they do want to get that done, you know, short of going to find, you know, another capital sponsor. Uh, scramble, I think, Especially is what the seller's saying. Do. What, what's going on here? When are you going to close? Um, so, so one thing that we do, and I'm, I'm happy to share with this group, and I don't know where we got this idea. It probably wasn't us because we're not very smart. But um, uh, when we issue an LOI in a, in a competitive process, um, we will actually put in the LOI, if we don't have our, you know, I, I guess occasionally we'll have our, our equity partner kind of lined up and, and we'll co-sign our LOI, and then it kind of takes that risk off the table. But in the cases where we don't, um, we will uh, we will put in our LOI basically give a give a, a two stage um, exclusivity so basically giving ourselves 30 days uh, within which to sign up our our uh, our equity partner on the deal and then we have that done that triggers another 60 days of exclusivity so um, it's kind of putting where putting our money where our mouth is with sellers um, and and we found that's something that that's helped get uh, sellers and investment bankers comfortable uh, signing an LOI with us but um, but we had a deal. Um, where we did that and we had two groups that were interested. This was kind of, uh, you know, 20, 25 days into our, our, uh, our, our initial exclusivity. And, and we had had, had management zooms with both, uh, both parties and like within 24 hours of each other for different and kind of not very good reasons. We thought both part, both these groups pulled out. And so here, here we are kind of left holding the bag, but we had developed a, a very good relationship with the sellers. Um, they liked us. So we, we really liked them. And we just asked we should give us another 30 days. Um, and they were good with that. And uh, 30 days went by and uh, we still didn't have anybody uh, lined up. We had a group we were talking to that, that, that also kind of ended up falling out of bed. Um, this was an automotive deal. Um, and there's not a lot of folks that, that want to invest in the automotive industry, um, which we learned. Um, but it was a great business. They, they got a kind of pretty unique sort of asset light model and, and, and we really believe in the business. And so uh, we didn't, by the second 30 days, still didn't have anybody lined up. And so the, the investment banker was kind of ready to, to take the deal back to, you know, back to a broader process, but, um, kind of right early on in that process, we found what was the right group. It was somebody who we should have reached out to, you know, three months prior, just, you know, stupid me. I didn't think of these guys. Um, and, uh, and it worked out and, and because we had developed a relation, good enough relationship with the seller and the investor banker to just, you know, say, Hey, work with us here. Um, we're making progress. We love your business. We really believe in the model. Um, they know there's, there's a kind of a limited appetite for, for automotive and, you know, for investors doing automotive deals. And so they, they were willing to work with us. Rob. I think Chris touched on something that's very important and that's the relationship with the seller. Um, if the independent sponsor has a really good relationship with the seller, you can manage those landmines. I've fortunately not had a capital provider retrade on a deal or back out of a deal. Um, I always ask them, hey, what information do you need? What is, what do you need to do to sign exclusivity with me? So we have expense sharing. 
Um, you know, some groups, they do those people management, you know, psych I call them psychological profiles. Sometimes capital providers, that's a red line for them. Other times it's not so much. Um, you know, hopefully, or hopefully I never have a capital provider retrade, but I always ask, hey, you know, what's important to you and how can I get that to you before we sign exclusivity? Wonderful. Thank you. Well, we've come up to five minutes left and want to throw it out to the crowd here to see if there's any questions out there. Well, yeah, the, the logic is that you, you're basically kind of only asking for 30 days of exclusivity from the seller um, and say, hey, look, if, if we get to 30 days and if you don't you know, think we can get the, the financing, it's basically you know, give us time to get the financing done. Um, and, and you're kind of really only asking for 30 days of exclusivity. And that, at that point, then they've got the choice to either just kind of cut ties and, and maybe go to the, the number two uh, LOI. Um, or again, if it, it, if it's you know we're all working together in good faith and we think we're making progress, which frankly is you know again if you've got a good relationship, um, that's usually how it, we found that that that's that's how it can work out. So, um, but we've just found that's a, that's been an effective way to get get sellers comfortable. Um, I mean that, that's you're being really upfront and honest with them, and that's that a lot of independent trusts aren't necessarily being very clear of exactly where the money's coming from. Oh, I work with the family office, and so Chris's approach, you know, I, I think obviously probably builds goodwill, but also proves your relationship that they're willing to work with you when you're being straightforward and yeah. you don't have all the capital lined up. Yeah. And just to add some value to this panel here, <laughs> as counsel to sellers for sometimes, we're going to advise our seller not to take a 90 day exclusivity. You know, they could, you know, that's 90 days for them off the market if this deal's not going to get done. So, you know, I think would be much more amenable to a shorter exclusivity period if there's reason to it. So that makes a lot of sense. The reality is if that happens, they, they, they kind of have a busted process at that point. Right. right. So it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say it's illusory, but it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, we find it's really effective. It also gives opportunity to build that relationship, right? Where you're not coming out of the gates asking for, you know, non-market terms. Um, but as you, if you can come up to that 30 days, 45, whatever it may be, and you've got to sort of negotiate an extension, hopefully during that time, you've built up the relationship where they're willing to do so. Anyone else? We've got just, oh, go for it, sorry. Well, yeah, it's, it, but they're, they're co-signing an LOI, just like, you know, you'd sign an LOI without having done QV anyway, right? So um, it's, it's kind of the same principle. So it's, uh, and we're, we, we spell that out in our LOI that, that, you know, we need to have our, our equity partners will co-sign and it'll be somebody mutual agreeable, mutually agreeable to us and the sellers, um, but they will co-sign this LOI under these terms uh, within 30 days. And, and more or less, you're committing the capital provider. Hey, go! You're going to spend money with us. You're going to, you know, we're, we're agreeing. We got our partner. We're going to get QB signed up, right? That's, at that point, it's it's you signing an LOI like you would on any other deal, just with only sixty days of. Yeah. Time for one more. So I I will tell one quick one other random uh, what an independent sponsor did, which I thought was actually it actually worked out well for them. But so they uh, actually as a, as a guy I knew, this is probably going back 10, 12 years. And he's like, hey, I got this company. I got another letter. The manager team's going to be in next week. You know, here's the information. Why, why don't you come and, you know, meet the management team? I'm like, oh, sure. Wow. Okay. You're going to be in my, my town? Yeah. I'll, we're, it's at this hotel. I'm like, perfect. We'll go sit down with the management team. So I walk in the room and there's a lot of people there. And I looked at it. I'm like, there's someone from Falcon. There's someone from Prudential. There's someone. He invited five capital providers and there was a sixth on the phone. So he basically ran a roadshow with the management team. So I've, I've never seen that before. I, I thought I was doing a one-on-one -on -one meeting with management, but here we go. He just put us all in the room and he, he, he got the deal done, uh, you know, 45, 60 days later. But it was like, did, did he a former investment banker? He was a former. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right? Had to have been. <laughs> all right. Well, that concludes our time. I want to thank Robbie, Chris, Rob, Evan for their time. Thank you to you guys and gals out there. Um, and hopefully you enjoyed the uh, session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian.